okay? Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for making the trip in in the snow. I know some schools were either closed or delayed, so I appreciate you making the trip. Can you hear me clearly in the back? Okay. So the, the plan for this morning is to uh, spend the first hour reviewing STEMI and uh, talking about some EKG tricks, some key historical findings. And then we're going to go through protocol updates after break and then case review. For anyone who's watching remotely, this presentation has a lot of EKGs in it, so do everything that you can to, uh, to make that visible on your screen. This is a quote that I like I'm talking about EKGs. And this is by one of the pioneers of, of EKG technology. He just didn't think it was going to work out that well or uh, be that something that we'd really use day to day. I also like this because it just reminds me about the things that we think are sure of today that we may be wrong about tomorrow. And then I just wanted to give thanks to the person who taught me most of what I know about EKG. It was uh, Steve Lowenstein, who's a professor at University of Colorado um, and also a former paramedic. So the learning objectives today, we're going to talk about the diagnostic features in terms of the history that make acute coronary syndrome more likely. We're going to talk about key EKG findings with inferior, anterior, and posterior MI. And the reason we're going to talk about these different clinical syndromes is that when I'm in the hospital, I have an almost unlimited number of people to call on to handle the complications, to deal with the, the things that will come. But when you're on the scene or in the back of an ambulance, your resources are far more limited. And I think that puts a pr uh, priority on predicting what's going to happen in this case. What, do I, what complications do I need to be ready for? And so we'll talk about those things. And then we'll talk about STEMI mimics. So I think we all agree that what we're trying to do, particularly with STEMI, is to decrease the event to balloon time. So we know that when someone is having a STEMI, the maximal benefit in myocardial salvage is in the first hour, ideally in the first 90 minutes, and then the benefit is still there but drops off significantly after that. So that's part of a whole cascade of events, educating the public to call early, getting pre-hospital response and pre-hospital cath lab activation for the patients who will benefit, and then getting a door to balloon time of less than 90 minutes. But I think the door to balloon time, that just talks about the hospital's part of it. Our, our key indicator is what is the event to balloon time from the time that that artery gets occluded until the time the artery gets opened. And that's where EMS is so critical. And so what, who are the patients that benefit from this? The, in acute coronary syndrome, we are talking about patients who have plaque rupture. So these are not patients who have generally coronary artery disease and have their typical angina. This is when you have this, uh, you have a plaque that then ruptures, you get a thrombus that forms, and then that thrombus is propagated. That's the pathology that we're trying to address with the balloon. That's also the pathology, this propagation of the thrombus that we're addressing by giving aspirin. We know that those two things are proven to save lives. And so as we go through this, and we're going through the history, we're trying to figure out, is this the event that's going on? Because these are the patients who benefit from early cath. So this is the challenge for us in EMS. Who is going to benefit from an emergent cath, and how can we decrease the event to balloon time? And then how can we minimize the cath lab activations for patients who do not fall in that group? We know that there are some patients who are going to present and are going to have a compatible history, and they're going to have ST elevation, and they're going to go to the cath lab, and they may have Takasubo cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome. That's okay. 
we, we're talking about finding these patients who have a history and an EKG that's compatible with plaque rupture and getting those patients to the cath lab. So as a refresher, here's the Clark County protocol. And I would say in doing case review, the, the times that we're most likely to activate the cath lab for someone who is not going to benefit from it are if the symptoms don't match. And this can be a tricky thing. We'll talk more about this. But active chest pain, less than 12 hours. Those are the patients who are potentially benefit from cath. And then ST elevation, one millimeter or greater in at least two contiguous leads. No left bundle branch block or paste rhythm, except left bundle branch block with concordance in one or more leads. And we'll talk through that more specifically and we'll show some examples. And then no active bleeding, severe liver failure, severe systemic disease. And these two things, the, the active chest pain less than 12 hours, we all know that although we would really like to have patients that give really clear histories and answer our questions just like we ask them, that that doesn't always happen. And so I want to emphasize that online medical control is always available to help you sort through the gray area and these patients where, um, where you're just not quite sure if their symptoms meet cath lab activation criteria. Similarly, this, this last part about active bleeding, severe liver failure, severe systemic disease, um, that's also another thing that online medical control can be very helpful in sorting out. So as you know, we're then notifying the emergency department, providing the above care, including aspirin, nitro, and analgesia where that's appropriate, code three transport to P-Cell Southwest, and this is another key thing, and the phrase that I remember is, one ECG begets another, meaning if you get one ECG, you should probably be getting another, because these things change over time. That's the other thing that I find it hard to emphasize enough. The, even on patients that do not have a STEMI, the initial pre-hospital EKG is so critical. Um, and I can, I can think of five cases in the last couple of months where we've been able to make the diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome, not a STEMI, but acute coronary syndrome with active EKG changes because we're able to compare the pre-hospital EKG to what we have in the hospital. And we see that their ST segments are changing in response to the treatment we're giving them. We see that the T waves are inverting. So your, that initial and the subsequent 12 lead EKGs are critical to making that diagnosis. And I can also point to a number of cases where someone initially did not meet STEMI criteria, uh, but then the MI evolved while, while people were in the back of the ambulance with him and, uh, and then got upgraded to STEMI. I think the life hacks are very good about that and that they will, they will trigger another 12 lead if they see a change. Uh, but your clinical suspicion is also a very good indicator. And so there's, uh, it's a, cheap, non-invasive test, uh, don't hesitate to repeat the EKG serially. And then if you have inferior MI, do V3 and V4R to look for right-sided MI and use caution with nitroglycerin. And we'll show some more specific examples of that. So what things make acute coronary syndrome more likely? This is really, this is difficult, and this is, a lot of this involves the art of medicine. Now, I think, you know, we've all heard about the very, the very classic findings, and I don't think that we should disregard those. This is from a paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association about how do you figure out if your patient is having acute coronary syndrome. And so this is looking at a bunch of patients who ultimately were diagnosed with acute coronary syndrome. What are the things that best predicted actually having acute coronary syndrome. And this, it's, uh, this number is called the positive likelihood ratio, but in English that just means how much more likely are they to have this if they have this symptom. 
And so if you're, so take diaphoresis, you're about two times more likely to have an acute coronary syndrome than someone who does not have, if you have diaphoresis, than someone who does not have diaphoresis. I'm just gonna, Doug, I'm getting this, uh, the icon is bouncing here. Is there anything else I need to do with GoToMeeting? Okay. So chest pain radiating to both arms is actually a very good predictor of acute coronary syndrome. Now, it doesn't mean that this is not something else like an aortic dissection, but it's something that should make you very concerned for an acute coronary syndrome. Chest radiating, radiating to the right arm is actually a better predictor of an acute coronary syndrome than chest pain radiating to the left arm. Doesn't mean you disregard chest pain radiating to the left arm. That still makes you over two times more likely than someone who doesn't have that to have an acute coronary syndrome. Having any chest pain at all, obviously very good predictor of an acute coronary syndrome. Having diaphoresis and having nausea or vomiting are, are very good predictors. And so I think this, this reminds me of um, Something that I learned uh, very early on in paramedic school is if your patient is sweating, you should probably be too. Yeah, they, I mean, they do, they do add up, and they do become more likely. Now, obviously, some of these are mutually exclusive, so you can't have um, chest pain, you know, chest, right arm, left arm, both arms and chest pain, all these things go together. But yes, someone with, yeah, absolutely. Someone with chest pain, diaphoresis, nausea, and vomiting is much more likely to have an acute coronary syndrome than someone who has none of those things or even two of those things. And, and ask yourself, does that fit with your clinical experience? So, But uh, to go back to the protocol, if these, so these are the things that should make you more concerned. And we're talking about symptoms less than 12 hours. Now, we all recognize that there are gray areas. There are patients who said, oh, I felt, you know, I felt awful two days ago. And then, you know, and then now I've had, I've had pain that started a little bit 13 hours ago. And then I got really bad two hours ago. If there's any question, just discuss, these are good cases to discuss with online medical control. Yeah. Yeah. Um, shortness of breath, it's, it falls at about 1.5. So it is in there. Uh, it's in there. It's just not as good a predictor as, uh, as these other things. Yeah, exactly. It's not when you... When you think about all the patients that you've seen complaining of shortness of breath, all the patients you've seen complaining of chest pain and diaphoresis. A lot of times, if you have shortness of breath and it's not, it's not explained by a chronic condition that you kind of know, it seems like that that's very often Yeah. No, abs absolutely. And so, and I think this, you're, you're absolutely getting at, so let me just repeat for the people. The question was, how good a predictor is shortness of breath? And um, so I think that absolutely gets to the art of being a clinician. And so if someone's got shortness of breath and they don't have a history of asthma or COPD, doesn't feel like that, it's definitely something that we need to take seriously as a potential acute coronary syndrome. More likely more likely in diabetics who have um, different nervous function, more likely in women who are more likely to present with atypical symptoms. So you, if you had someone who, say you had someone who was only complaining of shortness of breath, and they, I just feel like I can't catch my breath, and it's been going on less than 12 hours, and they have findings compatible with a STEMI, I think that that's a perfectly reasonable cath lab activation. And if you have, and if you have questions, say they also they also have a history of COPD, they're complaining of shortness of breath, they're not wheezing. I would not have because that's someone who you know go back to the the primary challenge we're trying to face. We're trying to get the people who are going to benefit from this to the cath lab as quickly as possible, and we're also trying to minimize activation of the cath lab, 
for patients who are not going to benefit. I think if you're talking about making a decision like that when you're in a clinical gray area, it is very reasonable to have the backup of, of online medical control to help make that decision. Because you're, t you know, you're talking about a significant commitment of resources, but you're also talking about a significant potential benefit for that patient. Yeah. Right. No, I, I mean, it really, it surprised me. And, um, but that's, uh, and I, I've certainly, I mean, I've certainly seen this in clinical practice, but that's part of the reason that I bring this up is that it's counterintuitive. And I think before I started really looking into this, I thought, eh, right on, that, that really doesn't mean anything. And I think, you know, I think what we've learned um, is that that actually does mean something. It can mean something, and these are patients that we, should, uh, that we should take seriously and think about acute coronary syndrome. Does that answer your question? Any other questions about this? Okay. So let's go on to the different regional distributions. So the first thing we're going to talk about are anterior MIs, which are almost, resulting, almost always resulting from a problem in the left anterior descending artery. So here's the coronary anatomy with the EKG leads laid over it. So here you have your right coronary artery, the left main coronary artery, left anterior descending, and then the circumflex coming off of that. And then you see the EKG leads laid over that. So here is V1, V2, V3, and so on. This uh, goes on to show some posterior leads, V7, V8, V9. This also shows you where V4R is. And then as far as the, uh, the limb leads, this shows you where AVR is, where AVL is, and then 2 AVF. I'm sorry, three AVF, then two. Um, so what we're talking about first are problems with the left anterior descending that's going to affect the left ventricle. So we'd expect to see ST elevation in V1 through V4. And the clinical syndrome that you're likely to see with this is pump failure, systolic failure. You can see bundle branch blocks. Uh, because the left anterior descending supplies the bundle branches. And then because you've got ischemia to the ventricles, this is where you tend to see ventricular arrhythmias. And this is just, I mean, you can, this is, if you will, the big engine. This is the most myocardium. And the more leads you see, the more elevation, the more myocardium is affected. And so when you see big elevation, V1 through V4, that's when you're talking about a large anterior MI. And this is just another picture to, to look at why this is. So here's the, here's the right, and then here's the left coronary artery. Um, the anterior septal comes off of there and supplies the septum, which is where you get the bundle branches. We also have an, an, another anterior septal perforator comes off, supplies more bundle branches, the diagonal, and then these branches off the uh, off the circumflex. So, an anterolateral MI is where you're starting to get problems to the left circumflex as well. That can either be right here around the branch or it can involve both the left anterior and the circumflex. And so that's when you start to see, with the anterior lateral, you start to see the elevation in V5 and V6. And then you start, you start to see reciprocal changes in AVL and 1, because those are looking across that part of the myocardium. Okay. So take a look at this EKG. A 63-year-old man with a history of hiatal hernia he complaint. He'd had some intermittent hernia pain over the last few weeks, but then sudden onset of severe abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. Called 911 from the, from the truck stop. And then just take a second, whether it's you write it down or make commit it in your head, um, what's your interpretation of this EKG and what would you do with it?
and then I'll show you how the case progressed. It was 90 minutes later. And so then in addition to what we got back here, so we have elevation V1, V2, V3, of reciprocal changes in AVL, just the very, uh, the very beginnings of reciprocal change in one. And then as this develops, then you're starting to get the elevation in V4, V5. So I continue on in, in V4, V5 and V6 not yet affected. You get deepening reciprocal changes. And then you're starting to get inferior changes here. So this is, this is someone who's got an LID that comes around and goes back to the inferior wall. So to go back to our diagram here, different, this, this stuff in gray is a little bit different in different patients. Um, so the circumflex supplies different portions of the posterior, and then the right can supply different portions of the inferior in different people. So you can get slightly different distributions. So here you're getting this guy who's involving both an anterior MI and then he's starting to get an inferior MI as well with the changes in 2, 3, and AVF. Questions about that EKG? Here's another one, 46-year-old um, complaining, uh, complaining of chest pain and shortness of breath. Take a second to interpret that EKG and say what you would do with it. And which, which artery is probably affected in this guy? Yeah. yeah, probably. So you've got some vent here, but then probably affecting the circumflex. But you've got some elevation D1, D2. No, almost in D3. You got, then you got big reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. So let's go on to talk more about inferior MI. So this is usually involving the right coronary artery. So the big clue to picking up an inferior MI is AVL, because that's reciprocal to the changes that, you're, that you'll see. And we'll look at that, we'll look at that diagram of the whole heart again. So the big complications that you get with an inferior MI are a right ventricular infarction because of the way the right comes around. You can get AV block because the right coronary artery supplies the AV node. And then you can get posterior wall involvement. And we'll talk about that in the last section. So here's our map of the heart again. So now we're talking about the right coronary artery coming down here. You see how it can come around and it can supply the posterior as well. And so the leads that you're going to pick this up in, two, sorry, three, AVF, two. And AVL is so helpful because it's essentially looking at this from the side. And sometimes you'll see changes in AVL even before you see the elevation in the inferior leads. So this is, AVL is essentially a side view into what's going on in the territory of the right coronary artery. You're zooming in on the right coronary artery. So it comes off, can supply the right ventricular branch. There's a separate little branch that goes off to the AV node. Occasionally, it'll supply the posterior and then the, even the posterior part of the left ventricle. So when you see right ventricular involvement, it's somewhere between 35 and 50% of inferior MIs. So it's not rare. Half of those that we see it are hemodynamically significant. And V4R is very sensitive and very specific for picking this up. 
when the right ventricle is involved, because of how it affects your preload, mortality is seven times higher. And um, just um, think, just think in your head, who's had the experience of having someone who has a right ventricular MI just bottom out the pressure? So these these are patients that appropriately, here, yeah, we should be very cautious with. So take a look at this EKG. 52-year-old man, bilateral arm pain and numbness, a fullness in his throat. He was also complaining of nausea and diaphoresis. So write down what your interpretation of this EKG is and what you would do with this EKG. Yes. Yeah. So, Captain Hollingsworth asked, do you, ask, uh, do you have a V4R? Great question. Okay, so these are right-sided leads. So here's, here's V4R. Yeah. So this is an inferior MI with, uh, with right-sided involvement. Here's, a, here's another EKG, 51-year-old man complaining of chest pain, two hours. Write down your interpretation of this EKG and what you do with the findings. So, and the thing that you see, so I think you see the you see the ST elevation here. You also see the reciprocal change in AVL. You're seeing the same thing here, even in this initial um, in this initial EKG. You're seeing big reciprocal changes in V4. In, sorry, in AVL. So that's your that's your clue, and that's that can really help you separate some of the mimics from a true inferior MI. Here's another one, 55-year-old man, intermittent chest pain, mild dyspnea. Uh, write down what you, uh, what you think of this EKG and what you would do with it. one make anyone nervous? Yeah, should. This, I mean, this is a this is a difficult EKG to interpret. Um, these changes are subtle, and I, I mean, I think you can say you have one millimeter in three in AVF. You do have the reciprocal change in AVL. I, this is a case where I would not hesitate to get physician backup, especially if the symptoms are inconsistent or you're not sure about whether they really fit STEMI. But I think in some way, I mean, if you, uh, if you give me this patient in the back of the ambulance and he's got crushing chest pain, radiating to both arms, he's diaphoretic, I think you can say, look, he's got, he meets protocol. He's got ST elevation greater than two leads. He's got reciprocal change, which increases your diagnosis. So a lot of this is going to hinge on your history and whether he has a compatible history. I think with a compatible history, 
I think that this is uh, this is an EKG that supports activating the cath lab, and get back up if you're not if you're not convinced either on the history or on the EKG. Okay. What about this one? So in addition to the inferior findings, what else jumps out of you about this EKG? What else? Yeah, possible posterior. V1 looks okay. V2 uh, definitely has ST, ST depression. V3 has ST depression. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about some other clues that you can use to figure that out. But this, this person, uh, acute severe pain for four hours. Um, elevation in 2, 3 in AVF, reciprocal change in AVL. At, at a minimum, this person has an inferior MI. Okay. So the AV block, in the patients that we see in the emergency setting, it's only about 8%. So this is not incredibly common that you have an inferior MI with an AV block, but it's something that can really impact your pre-hospital management. And so it often is stepwise. And so we typically say, a first degree block doesn't really matter. Um, first degree block in the setting of an inferior MI should make you concerned that this could progress. Uh, can progress to a second degree block, usually to the winky block, and then occasionally onto a complete block, usually is responsive to atropine. So I don't want to say this is something that you're going to see tomorrow necessarily or in the next month, but it's probably something that you'll see at some point in the next year or two someone going into an AV block with an inferior MI. So it's just something to, uh, to park in your brain and just th think about. I think it, we've all had that experience where it's just that much easier to take the next step when you thought, this could be the next thing that goes wrong. Okay, now we'll go on to talk about uh, posterior MI, which is you either coming from the right coronary artery or the left circumflex. These can be more difficult to figure out because of that. So coming back to our, uh, our picture of the heart, so this can either be the posterior wall, so what's back here on the back side of this, can either be sub supplied by the right coronary artery, by the circumflex, or by some combination of both. In rare cases, like that one we, uh, we saw earlier with the left anterior descending, you have a very big dominant left anterior descending that even wraps around and supplies some of the posterior wall. That's about 10% 10 per, 10 of the time. So because it doesn't follow as clear distribution as the other ones, the posterior MI is most easily missed. It's also because we don't have any true posterior leads in our standard EKG, but I'll talk about how to get around that. So you can get posterior MI in isolation, or it can go with an inferior MI or with a lateral MI. And so again, as a reminder, these are the things that are variable from person to person in these posterior, these posterior branches. So that's part of what makes this so difficult to pick up. So with a true posterior infarct, so in this drawing you've got the heart turned around and you're looking at the back side of it. You're either getting the distal circumflex or the, um, post the lateral parts of the right coronary artery. And so you see changes in V1 and in V2. Those are the closest thing that we have to posterior leads. Go back to this. So here V1 and V2. So they're looking at that portion of the heart but they're looking at it from the front. So the changes that you see are a mirror image of what you would, of what you would see if you were looking directly at it. So I hope we never go to completely to computers for looking at EKGs because it's really nice to be able to take the paper 
and just flip it upside down and look at V1 and V2 as if you were looking directly at that posterior portion of the heart. And so ST depression ST depression, V1, V2, is ST elevation in when you're looking at the posterior part, portion of the heart. So this is called the reciprocal sign. So when you're seeing tall or broad, or broad R waves, which are what would be Q waves if you were looking directly at that, and especially an R, R to S greater than 1 in V2 and an upright T in V2. So here's what that would look like tall or broad R, R to, R to S greater than 1, meaning that the R wave is greater than the S wave. And then this um, upright, upright T in V2. So that should concern you for a posterior MI. So in addition to the clues we talked about, so remember we're looking for ST depression, V1, V2, and then if you're looking for a tall or broad R wave, V1 or V2, and especially an R that's bigger than the S in V2. Those are concerning signs for a posterior MI. Okay. So 57-year-old male, six-hour history of left-sided chest pain, radiates to his back. He's got nausea, shortness of breath, and diaphoresis, normal vital signs. So how would you interpret that EKG? What's that? Um, I, w I will do if there's un uncertainty about that. Uh, Dr. Will, what do you think about that, about the posterior leads? So I would not. This is. I would not say that this getting the posterior leads here is not the equivalent of V4R for a right ventricular infarction. More difficult to do in the field. You know, you've got the patient on your gurney. You're talking about sitting them up, getting those leads around the back. So what I would hang my hat on is what V1 and V2 look like when you're concerned for a posterior MI. Um, I just mentioned this as a thought experiment. So the way this is moving, um, and I don't, this is not widely adopted in clinical practice yet, but what some people are thinking about is essentially, you essentially have this EKG vest that has 80 leads. There's even some, there are even some people who talked about 150 lead vest. And what you're doing essentially is you're measuring the ST elevation in this segment here and then turning that into a heat map about where, where the ST elevation is and how you can figure that. Not something that's going to be in the protocols this year, not something that's going to be in the protocols next year. Um, but essentially, it's just, I, I like this because it's a different way to think about what we're doing. What we're essentially doing is we're using our brains to create something like this. We're creating a mental map of where the heart is not getting enough oxygen. Okay, let's talk about mimics. And then we'll... So the big mimics that we're going to talk about are left ventricular hypertrophy, pericarditis, left ventricular aneurysm, and benign early repolarization. And we'll talk about a couple of tricks for each. Okay. So uh, say you have a 50-year-old man um, complaining of intermittent chest pain for the last two days. What would be your interpretation of this EKG, and what would you do with the findings? What's that?
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any votes for activating the cath lab on this one? Yeah. This is the this is the classic left ventricular strain pattern. So you do not have concordance. You have the ST depression in V5 and V6. You got LVH by voltage, and uh, and you've got left axis widen, and you've got the the widened slurred QRS. So this is the classic left ventricular strain pattern. Okay. What about this EKG? 56-year-old man um, complaining of uh, eight hours of intermittent chest pain. So is there concordance in this EKG? Yeah. We've got concordant elevation, V4, V5. So with a compatible clinical history, um, this, is, this is someone I think it's reasonable to activate the cath lab on. Yeah, this, I mean, it's, it's got some LVH, but then also has concordance. Yeah, no, that's, that's the other, I mean, so it's just barely meeting voltage criteria. Looks a lot like LVH here, but then as someone pointed out, in V4, V5, V6, you really don't have those big elevations. So, oh, sorry, the big, uh, big voltage. This is something that looks a lot like LVH, but is actually a STEMI with concordance. Okay? So the hallmark of pericarditis is global ST elevation. So when you look at this EKG, you've got elevation one, two, three. You've got depression in AVR, which is looking opposite the rest of the leads. So PR depression in AVL, ST elevation, ST elevation, ST elevation, ST elevation, ST elevation, ST elevation. So this does not fit an anatomic distribution. This is what you will typically see with pericarditis. So uh, benign early repolarization. So with benign early repolarization, you typically have um, elevation, most common V2 and V3. You have J point elevation, and sometimes you can even have notching. You just get a little suggestion of that here. Uh, you typically have this concave up ST segment. So benign early repolarization is very rare after age 50. It's um, much more, it's more common in men, more common in fit young men, slightly more common in African American men. So concave upward, J point notching, most prominent in the anterior leads, large symmetric concordant T waves. So T waves, large symmetric, all concordant to the direction of the QRS as you go around the uh, anterior, anterior leads. And then there are no reciprocal changes or pathologic Q waves. So certainly people can have MIs under 50. Certainly people in their 20s can have MIs. 
uh, these are the findings that are going to help you differentiate benign early repolarization from an ST elevation MR. So with left ventricular aneurysm, your, uh, your big clues, your biggest clue is the history. This is someone who's recently had an MI, most often was hospitalized with an MI, Occasionally, they'll give you a story that I had, you know, I had bad, really bad chest pain, but then it seemed, seemed to get better, but I've been feeling weak since then. But you have these big, deep Q waves, um, V1, V2, V3, with this elevation. Um, these are, this is certainly a case, you know, case that we've seen here, one that we went over in case, um, similar to one we went over in case review. So with a recent MI, the big deep Q waves, and this, this elevation have to be concerned for left ventricular aneurysm. Questions about the mimics? Yeah. So the question was, cocaine-induced chest pain with S with ST elevation. Um, I would. I mean, if someone is ha is has used cocaine and is having chest pain with ST elevation, I still think you have to be concerned for an acute coronary syndrome. Now, it could just be because of vasospasm, um, and I think that's also it's a case where I'd involve online medical control because it's a very it's a very gray area and a 20 year old who's having ST elevation changes after using cocaine is a very different situation than a 50 year old who's having those changes um, do you, yes I don't see uh, I don't see rise but I definitely have seen ACS in someone who especially in chronic cocaine users it doesn't automatically kick them out, but it's definitely something that you want to include in, include in your report and include in your decision making. Okay, we'll do a few practice and then we'll wrap up. Okay. So, 47 year old man, six hours of chest pain. It's a little bit pleuritic. He's got some mild shortness of breath. Write down what you think of this and what you do with it. Any votes for activation of the cath lab with this? If you're saying don't activate, why why would you not activate with this? But you have really you really do have global ST um, global ST elevation. And all the way around, you've got the depression in AVR, which is the one lead that looks opposite the rest. About this 58 year old man with syncope. Yeah. So I hear a lot of murmurings of LVH. I think you've you've got LVH by by voltage criteria. Um, you do not have any concordance. You've got the strain pattern with a down. Um, ST depression in V5 and V6. Okay, 47-year-old okay. man, sharp chest pain. Any votes for activation with this?
Does anyone does anyone want to speak up for why this might be a STEMI? Or does anyone want to speak to why it's why it might not be? There is ST elevation in a lot of leads. Um, is there ST elevation in every lead? Which leads do not have ST elevation? Yeah. AVL one. Yeah. So I would argue this does not fit a classic pericarditis pattern because you got one looks normal. AVL is starting to be depressed, which remember we said is a clue for an inferior MI. So this is looking like someone who's got the wraparound LAD with, uh, with elevation in the lateral leads, elevation in the inferior leads, depression in AVL. This is a very tough EKG. Um, and again, you need, you need a compa compatible history. And again, I don't, you are not alone in making this decision. And so you can describe this as an EKG where you've got elevation in V3 uh, B3 through V6 in 2, 3 in AVF, but not in, not in AVL, not in 1. And uh, so this guy ended up having an inferior and lateral STEMI. 100% um, proximal RCA occlusion. Okay. These are tough. These are tough calls, and that's why I emphasize that you're not alone in making these decisions. So as, just as reminders, so take home points, and then we'll wrap up and take a break. So cath lab activation is a history and an EKG that are compatible with plaque rupture. Anterior MI, think about systolic failure, bundle branch block, ventricular arrhythmias. Inferior MI, look at AVL to help differentiate from the mimics. Think about right ventricular involvement and AV block. Posterior MI is very easy to miss. Look at V1 and V2 to help pick that up. And then with any activation, give yourself a pause to think, could this be one of the mimics of ST elevation MI? With that, I'll take any other questions. <coughs> Like where, do you want to go right ahead, or do you want to? No, no, we're going to give them a break. We had okay. a request uh, by a couple of people, both online and otherwise, to uh, to get copies of some of the some of the diagrams and some of the PowerPoint stuff. It's all being recorded. You know that's available. It's also re also available through GoToMeeting, um, and uh, we can probably publish it too. Some yeah, so time. yeah, some of these some of the EKGs come from Dr. Lowenstein and I don't have authority to publish them completely. I'm thinking but, they, but uh, we had a request for your for your uh, yeah. vector slide. Yeah, absolutely. Time. Absolutely. So. We can put that up and okay. that was previous lecture. So this this EKG does not meet criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy, although there's some things that could um, lead you to think that it does not meet voltage criteria. Still does have the ST elevation that would warrant uh, warrant activation. There was uh, there was some requests for the diagram. Uh, the way that I got it uh, was to Google ECG leads heart diagram, and it's the first uh, the first link that you get. And then uh, on the back side of your outline, there's an evaluation. This is the first time I've given this lecture, and I'm interested in your feedback. Thanks. Are we good? Okay. Uh, before I start, I want to announce one thing. Uh, just if you haven't, if you haven't looked at your um, agency's uh, information um, or bulletin board, there's a uh, trauma uh, review at Peace South Southwest Thursday morning, 7:15 in the auditorium. Uh, it's one of their quarterly reviews. There's an e there'll be an EMS case, and then they'll dissect the the thing. And of course, breakfast is provided. I'm not sure what, but uh, breakfast is provided. So 
Uh, everyone is all the all EMS are always invited, and there'll be some probably uh, quite a bit of interesting stuff to learn from glean from this case. So, okay, switch that light again. We're going to go to protocol changes. Uh, twice a year we do pro protocol updates. <coughs> what? I don't think so. What? I don't know. They're saying they can't hear me. You guys can hear me. They say they can't hear me on the go to meeting, so. How about now? How about now? Can they hear okay? Okay, good. Technology, wonderful. Okay. The major changes, now, here's how this works as it's always worked. I'll be, uh, today I'll be talking about protocol changes. They will not be in effect until basically the 1st of January. When you get, when you get the information. However, if you have, I mean, you get the written data. We're going to go back to the publisher to get our, our little, our little small versions reprinted as well. Uh, so don't don't get anxious about it. If you do something that's not that we didn't talk about today, it won't be a problem. If, however, you follow the protocols, you also won't be in a problem. Okay. So I'm going to talk about response to suicide, big big issue. We're going to talk about 10% dextrose, altered mental status changes, uh, spinal immobilization, which we've already got given the protocol update on. And we talk about induced hypothermia for return of spontaneous circulation and cardiac arrest because there's a big change going to come there. And then a few other protocol changes that will go very quickly. And how do I get this thing to move ahead? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Nope. Okay. Perfect. I had to kick that mouse out of there. So, I think the best way to talk about uh, response to suicide and your protocol is very simple. It's going to be one. It's going to be changes on one page only. So you can fall asleep for the next couple of minutes here. But I got to tell you how this all is coming down. Uh, you know, we've had problems, and the issue really is uh, law enforcement response to suicides and law enforcement response to EMS. And we're going to talk strictly suicide when a c patient calls in and says, I'm going to kill myself, or I want, I'm thinking about killing myself, and what happens with that? Not the ones that get called in and say, oh, uh, I found somebody unconscious and there's a bunch of pills around, or... They just cut their wrist and they're unconscious. That's going to come in as a different kind of call. That those will come in still as a um, overdose call, perhaps, or unconscious patient. Then you get out there and you find that the patient is really not unconscious and is re and is really taking a bunch of pills, or is unconscious and taking a bunch of pills. But I have to tell you how this has changed. This, this all came about mostly fr through the sheriff's office and other law enforcement thing. And it's in response to some um, issues that happened in the Ninth Circuit Court of, uh, of, of the U.S. Circuit Court, Ninth Circuit Court, which is the, the Northwest region. And it was in response to a couple of lawsuits which were against the police for... Um, using perhaps excessive force in dealing with someone on a suicide call. In other words, death by cop, uh, where, the, where the person was materially and severely harmed as a result of the police intervention. And the district attorneys in this area have been quite anxious about this and have basically told the police that there's almost no reason for them to use force legally against anybody. Now, 
I have some I have some difference in opinion. There's a lot of training that needs to be done with the police, and we've already talked about that. They're getting uh, they're getting an update of uh, 40 hours of uh, of uh, intensive uh, training dealing with uh, um, psychological issues. But they have we have then we've had a task force uh, working over the last month and, or a year and a half um, on trying to develop a protocol both at Cressa and at the sheriffs and other. <coughs> Uh, law officers uh, level to deal with suicides. So I need to tell you how we how this has come out at the first at the Cressa level, because that's where these Early calls are going to originate. Prison. The first priority when managing a suicidal threat is to ensure the safety of public and first responders. They have finally recognized that we need they need to assure your safety as well. Uh, so for Cressa. They ascertain whether the suicidal person's home or alone, or if there are other persons in the house. Are those persons free to leave, or are they hostages? Where are they going to be? Have threats been made to harm others? Has there been any threats toward first response or suicide by cop? That kind of threats. Are there weapons involved? Does he say, I have a gun, I'm going to kill myself, or not? Uh, is there military or law enforcement training? Small point there. Does the suicidal person, oh, uh, are there any extenuating or aggravating circumstances? Why do they want to end their lives? Attempt to talk directly to the suicidal person. Now, we're going to define, they define, cross the define, suicidal subject in progress. The subject in the process of committing suicide with a weapon or other method that will cause serious injury or death. In other words, pills. Subject has the means in their possession, the threat is imminent, or the act is in process. Their action at that point is to dispatch law enforcement. Law enforcement will go to the scene, assess, and call you at at their dis, at their determination. They will so you will not be immediately dispatched on that. Now that cuts that. Now if you're not dispatched, you don't have a duty to treat. You're not there. Suicidal subject. Just occurred. If the subject is unconscious or seriously wounded with potentially life threatening injuries, dispatch EMS with law enforcement. Now, will you still stage? Yes. If the subject injuries or accident have not caused life threatening results, that's, and granted, that's hard to determine on the phone, right? Dispatch law enforcement and they will call you at, after their determination of the of the scene. Dr. Yeah. Numerous times these calls come in uh, and we are on the call. I know. There is I know. no law enforcement I know. available. Do, uh, okay. Do me a favor and don't bring that up yet. <laughs> I am talking about calls that are only coming in as suicidal. Okay. Now, and I'll, I'll get to this a little bit now. Now, if the if the threat, if it's a suicidal threat only, they will create a CAD event using a type suicidal subjects, referral, transfer the call to the crisis line. If there's no criminal activity, the scene is stable, no disturbances, suicide is threatened, but the subject doesn't have a gun or a weapon and just says, I'm, I'm feeling bad about things. And then Crisis will have the CAD reference number, and Crisis will will talk with that patient. Crisis line, 24/7. If there's a subtype of, so, if the call taker believes there's a need for law enforcement to review the, in others, the ser it sounds like a serious enough threat. They will also do a threat subtype, which goes to goes in front of the the person on call, uh, uh, the supervisor of uh, or the patrol officer who's on duty at that time will actually see that in the pe their pending call screen, and they can evaluate whether they should go to the scene at that point too. If crisis cannot resolve the issue, or they think there is a significant 
an imminent threat, they will request law enforcement respond to that person, to that incident. Cressa will have the original event number and will continue that as an active call then. Now, so far, about a quarter of the calls that have come in have been effectively dealt with. Now, this has been in effect since October. And about a quarter of the calls have been effectively dealt with at the crisis level. Okay. Now, we had to... We had to set up some rules for the police to understand what was what. So, suicidal person is threatening, now this is on the police end of it, threatening by words or actions to terminate his or her own life, and it's reported to law enforcement or observed by the law enforcement officer. Engage or engagement means making communications contact with the suicidal person, not tying them up, knocking them down. It just means to engage them in, in conversation. Disengage means to terminate those communications and retreat to a safe location. Now, here is the police response to suicide. Their guidelines, and, and, and they're in the process of making sure, but the, we just met with the uh, sheriff's office yesterday and, uh, at District 6, and their guidelines now are they, they are responding to their, their intention and their instruction to their officers is to respond to all suicidal subject calls. Now, this has got to come in through, through it has to work through the system, the, the CRESA system, as suicide or suicidal threat. So they will respond to all calls that, are, that they receive from CRESA or through the crisis hotline. The decision to engage, limit the response, or disengage is based then on whether there's a known danger if that person is allowed to remain at large. And it's different if they're in their own private house than if they're in a public place. The ante goes up if you're in a public place. The officer has to determine whether the Subjects is attempting to force a confrontation with the police. They don't want to get caught in the suicide by police kind of thing. Um, and then they need to use the priority of life model, which is this. This is the hierarchy of how they determine whether a person, sh whether a person is at risk for, if they're at risk for harming other persons that that raises the ante. Um, uh, if they're only at risk for harming themselves, it's not considered as high on the, on the life protection model. So hostage and victims, number one. Innocent bystanders are number two. Other police or themselves and first responders, including all EMS personnel. And then the suspect, the, basically, if you decide you want to kill yourself and you have a gun, there's a limit to how much they're going to uh, put anyone else at risk, including themselves. And it makes a lot of difference if they're in their own house and they don't let you in. So, they're going to continue to evaluate need for engagement or disengagement. Option one is to engage verbally, make contact by telephone or other safe means, Talk with them if they're not if they're not overtly threatening. They'll be directly there. It's different if, like I say, it's different if they don't let them into the house. Then if they, they're not going to bust doors down. Option two is provide surveillance, loose containment of the area to keep other people safe. Option three, contain the area and consult SWAT. Now that that automatically raises the ante for a bad outcome. So this is not an exhaustive list, and they're working with that. And I like say every officer at the at the, the intention is to is to train all the officers in Clark County. Um, there's a 40-hour CIT training course that uh, that they're that 
Some of them have gone through already. There's a lot of office. I, I was absolutely amazed how many sheriffs are, how many sheriff officers and police officers we have. A lot more than EMS. Um, now, engage the patient using pre-approved guidelines, which they have there. I'm not. I'm not boring you with all of their guidelines. The law enforcement officer determines to become involved. This may be due to hostages or innocents in the area who need to be protected because contact with a suicidal person was established and they want help. It may be because the suicidal subject is unconscious. The decision to engage may be transitioned to disengagement as needed. In other words, if there are innocents in the house and they're removed, and the guy is still saying, I'm not going to go with you, I have a gun, I'm going to kill myself, they may leave the premise. They're not going to force the issue. Now, despite, despite what has been said on several occasions or several incidents, uh, this is not, I mean, Washington is not a, quote, right to die state. That has been, and, and that's, a, that's an issue that, but what, uh, the, the, right, the right to commit, um, uh, the right to do, a, to do suicide is actually, re, is actually reserved for only for uh, persons with terminal illnesses under, under the, under the um, uh, Washington uh, state statute. It's reserved for persons with terminal illness who have who who are not known to be depressed. That's kind of an arguable thing. If I have a if I have a terminal illness, I think I'm going to be depressed. Uh, but that's another story. Um, however, No one is going to really get in. No one is really going to jump on you, and I mean, no no police officer is probably going to shoot you to prevent you from killing yourself. Is the whole point of this? We're, we don't want to put up, and the police don't want to get in a position where they do excessive force to try to stop someone who seems convinced that they want to harm themselves. So most of the time we can we can talk these people down, and they and was a guy just recently who was standing on the bridge with a rope tied to the bridge and a rope around his neck, and he was going to jump off. And it took the police about five hours to talk him out. So I mean, they don't, you know, they obviously are going to do what they need to do in most circumstances. No. When appropriate, read that bottom line. The suicidal subject will be taken into custody and transferred to the hospital for continued mental evaluation and treatment. Okay. Disengage, though. They can disengage using the guidelines, which if, which if there are no innocents involved, there's no hostages involved, and the person, and, and they're going to have to use excessive and or deadly force to control the situation, they will disengage. Each call is different. All facts has to be, and they need to have, just like we do, and they need to have continued education and work out. We've been talking to them about trying to get some joint trainings in the future, which would be nice. Uh, uh, ways to control situations, ways to intervene in people who are, who are maybe um, uh, resisting, but not to the point of being, you know, dangerous. Um, in all cases of disengagement, though, the law, the law enforcement uh, attempts to provide that suicidal subject with resources they can use, such as the crisis line. Call back. And, you know, so. Now, finally, we're getting to your protocol. So, psychiatric disorders, including threat of suicide. Immediate danger to, now, general consider, if there's immediate danger to the patient or medical personnel, protect yourself and others. That's what the police are there for, to do. summon law enforcement. So if you get to the scene and you have a scene that's dangerous to you, call law enforcement. They will respond. They will not necessarily respond to 
and, they, and they've already don't respond to, if the call doesn't go as a suicidal call, they won't go. They don't automatically go on, on overdose, because a lot of these things come out as overdose or unconscious person or acting unusual. They don't go to acting unusual calls. If it says suicide, yes. Now, we've... Uh, back up, but we have a little bit of an issue, uh, and it's training. Mark and I have to get more involved in some of the, and, and Marlene, who's the head of, uh, of the uh, designated mental health professionals and, and the crisis line, uh, we're dealing with CRESA, because some of the CRESA call takers are uncomfortable or, or, or maybe reading between the lines, and they'll, they will sort of fudge something that they came in as, well, it's probably a suicidal to a overdose call. And that means you don't get an EMS, you don't get a law enforcement response. We had one just last week that went out that way, and so the sheriff wasn't dispatched. And EMS was sitting staging on scene thinking that it was a suicide call, and it wasn't dispatched to the sheriff as a suicide. It was not dispatched. So you request they requested law enforcement. Now request the mental health professional as needed. Now if there's no evidence of immediate danger, do your usual thing. This is not a change in your protocol. This is in your protocol now. Approach the patient, calm so manner, show self confidence, convey concern, reassure the patient. One EMT does the you know, is best to establish rapport and deal with the patient. Transport the patient as quickly as possible to appropriate facility, either, either ED. If the patient appears to have significant mental disorder and is refusing transport, so suicide or not, I mean mental disorder, consider police and or mental, and or mental health professional assistance if you're there before them. A police officer may, and we just went through this thing, at his or her discretion place the person on a hold or take them into custody. Should the officer elect to not place the person on hold and that person is, in your opinion, significantly impaired and at risk to themselves or other, here's the change, contact the designated mental, designated mental health professional. They're on 24-7. The number will be in your information. Now, they may be in evaluating a patient at that moment and you may be a little delay but Marlene suggests that it should be no more than five or ten minutes now at that point if it's going to be a more of a delay ask to talk just like you do now to to medical control Explain the situation to the designated mental health professional, including your assessment of the person's impairment. They may request then that you transport the patient against their will to either Clark County Emergency Department for evaluation, and if necessary, will instruct law enforcement, which they can do verbally, to place the person in custody. Now, law enforcement will still have the option if they say, well, this person is really agitated and, ha and has a weapon, I'm not going to interfere at this point, you're going to have to, well, you're going to have to follow that. I don't want you guys getting into harm's way. Now, if between the two or three or four or five or six of you, you can safely take this person down, restrain them without hurting them, and restrain them chemically as well, that's fine. And it may take a little negotiation with you and the, you know, the police officers are kind of experts on, on restraining people quickly. Now, it's, 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 by, it's, 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 it's by a little bit more force than we generally, I, you know, I worked 40 years in an emergency department and we've had many, many, many takedowns and I've never hurt anybody. But you need a minimum of five people to take one person down. 
And the ante goes up if they're really acting crazy, like uh, the so-called, um, um, you know, uh, the 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 delirium patients, you know, the drug drug and or psychiatric induced uh, delirium. Uh, and incidentally, the police really want your help in taking those people down. So that's the issue. Yep. Pardon? Right. Yes, you you can you can disengage if if you have no help if this person is putting you at risk, and you're talking to medical control, and say I cannot I cannot safely restrain this person without her, harming them them or me, you have to disengage, and you have to leave information that they can come at. Now we had a, a, a we had a case which is kind of convoluted, and I won't go into that but the net effect is the police disengage the 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 EMS disengage without going through the proper procedures which is talking to medical control or otherwise and uh, and then there was confusion of the family with uh, information as to how to call back or to get called back but anyway the patient became ultimately impaired, significantly impaired by the drugs and was not fighting anymore and uh, was ultimately transported to the hospital by their own family, interestingly enough. Uh, but uh, uh, always give them the option to call back. If somebody has a gun and says, I'm going to kill myself and the police aren't going to help you, or you can't, I mean, you're not going to go in there. I'm not going to go in there. You know, so... You got to consider the armed patient homicidal as well as suicidal, you know. So, all right. It's not a perfect solution. It's going to be, but we haven't had any major issues since. Okay, we got one. Right. Who 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 else would be able to put the person into uh, into control? Well, yeah, and, and if and if and if and if you can control them, you don't need to call law, law enforcement. Law enforcement is there to help you. No, that's not. No, no, that's not true. Yeah, basically the question. The the question I think is. Let me let me try to. Put, if if the person is not, if if you think the person is suicidal or significantly psychiatrically impaired to be to be at risk for themselves, and they don't want to go. And you call mental health professional, and they say, "No, this person needs to be evaluated. Bring them in." And it's safe or possible for you to restrain them on your own and bring them in. You don't need to call police. Okay, so that, that mental health professional right. is a route. Right. Exactly. Okay, and 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 if you can't get a hold of the designated health, designated mental health professional, you have the option always in this county to talk to medical control. And we have we have sort of maybe done a little overreach of our uh, of our authority in one sense, but uh, because there's nothing in the law that really well, what we've done is in the in in the state of Washington, the only physicians who can hold the person against their will for pending a mental health evaluation is an emergency physician. So we extend that to you on occasion, but that's that's kind of a fudge in the law. So, right. Well, yeah. I mean, because in those in those cases in those cases it doesn't it seems like it's not 
possible for you to restrain that person. If, if, indeed, if indeed you could restrain them and bring them in, with a, if you think that person needs to be brought in, I would call the designated mental health professional before I would call the police. If, she, if he or she says, yeah, bring this person in, we'll put a hold on it, if, can you safely bring this person in? Now, the, 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 the DMHP may not, may not agree with your assessment. And actually, it's nice to call the DMHP because a lot of times they know these same people. You know, a lot of our I'm going to kill myself folk have say that on a regular basis. And so they're known to the system. Yeah. They can. They can. They're just, well, in, in an ideal world, uh, as we were talking with the sheriff, yes, in an ideal world, they would have specially trained, we would have specially trained sheriff's officers, and and they would go out with, in the, as a team with the mental health. See, the sheriffs also go out to bring people in who are on, who are on hold by the court or by, or by the uh, uh, DMHP. They have the same problem. Is they, they can go out there to bring the person in, but they can't bust down the door to go get them. They have to be let in by someone in the house or the person, and, you know, and they cannot, and they're not going to go out and physically abuse somebody who needs to be brought in by the designated mental health professional. So, I mean, it's, a, it's not a perfect... There aren't enough DMHPs to go around. There's one on call at nighttime, and there's two on call until about, or two working until about, uh, until, you know, during the day and until about uh, midnight. So that is not enough for a county this size to have them be able to go out and make pickups. Now, they do have some available for known clients that where they're going to go a pickup, they'll go out with the with the sheriff because they can generally talk the person into opening the door. You also mentioned the sheriff has VPD bought off on it. VPD, VPD yeah, has, has bought on the concept, but they are actually doing their own, they have sort of got their own thing. And that has not really been a problem uh, in, for, v, we've not really had any problem. I have, I have several cases in the last, in the last two months where VPD and EMS have run in they, the one case, the woman was gobbling pills as they came in the door, and they just sort of scooped her up, popped her on a gurney, restrained her, and away they went. So uh, it, it depends. And the, sh the sheriff's office, I think, got, got a little bit off track at one point because they were dealing with... Um, um, they. Somehow their officers got the idea they wouldn't go on suicide. They will go now on everything that comes in as a suicidal call that's that's sent to them. Now, I suppose because they're covering a big area, there's not as many of them. Maybe you won't have the ready availability of a sheriff. Sometimes that's a possibility. But so report to to me any problems you have at any point and we'll and we'll continue to work this out and try to sort it out we I think you'll get a little bit more those are good questions because that does answer the kind of things like if you don't need you know if you can restrain the patient and they don't want to go you don't leave them at home you talk talk to someone who says yeah we're going to we're going to take you in and they generally say okay if they're forced with stuff. The reason I like to have the sheriff there, sometimes the sheriff says, do you want to go with me or do you want to go with these nice guys? And they'll, they'll, they'll pick the nice guy, generally. Yeah, one last question, then we've got to move on. No, no, your phone, the phone number will be coming out. It will be in your new order set. But it's quicker to use their phone number, of course. So, okay. Now we're going to talk about hypoglycemia a little bit. Here's some basic, a little minor basic science. 
We're going to talk D10 versus D50. Uh, we're going to go to D10 preferentially over D50 for treatment of hypoglycemia for a couple reasons. And number one of which, number one of which is there was a D50 shortage. AMR literally was out of D50 uh, a few months ago. You know, all the drug shortages are all, you know, but D50 was in short supply. D10 is actually, was actually in pretty good supply. I've heard that there have been some times now where D10 was a little short. Uh, D50 is extremely toxic if you, get, if you extravasate, if you don't get it out of the, you know, if you don't, if it gets out of the vein, it's, you know, it's so um, hyperosmotic that it's quite toxic in the, you know, in the subcutaneous. And why do we use D50 in the first place? Well, use of D50 um, predates, uh, it, it's an old standard of care for treatment of altered mental status. Uh, some of us are old enough to remember that in all altered mental status protocols, we automatically gave an AMP of D50 no matter what was going on because we didn't know, because we didn't have capillary blood glucose monitoring. When I, when, I, when I got out of medical school, we didn't have such a thing. We had a, we had a glucose, our glucose testing was done in the laboratory. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and there's very limited science, if any, supporting the use of D50. So here's the basic thing. An amp of D50 is 25 grams of glucose in 50 mils. In other words, 50 grams 50 in 100 grams. mils. So it's 25 grams in 50 mils. For a 100 kilogram adult, that's the same as giving them 0 0.25 grams per kilo. Now, interesting enough, the current, current PALS recommendation is giving that kid 0 0.5 to 1 gram per kilo, which is totally... I'm always surprised because the pediatricians are usually the ones who are really trying to do science, and that, that's two to four times the normal adult dose. And why? Okay. Normal blood glucose has about 100 grams per liter of glucose. So your normal glucose is 100 milligrams per deciliter. <laughs> When you go to the doc and they check you for diabetes, they check your normal glucose, they say you got 100 grams, you got 100 uh, milligrams of glucose. That's per deciliter, per 100 cc. So, uh, a one gram per liter. Adult blood volume is five liters, so in your entire serum blood glucose in the normal person is five grams of glucose. So we're giving them five times the amount of their total normal serum glucose when we give them 25 grams of D50. Yeah, well, not. You know, you know size does matter, but not in this. Uh, the, that's why when we, get, when we go out and we take care of people who are hypoglycemic, and we give them what we've always done for years and years and years, their, if they're a di obviously they're diabetic, if their glucose monitoring and their, glu their, their glucose levels are messed up for 24 to 48 hours after we treat them. Because we give them 25 grams of glucose and they're, they're, they're going to go from their level of 50 they're going to go into the 250, 300, 400 range and more news at 11, as they say. It, it doesn't work well. Now, for pediatrics, your pediatric blood volume has 80 to, to, is 80 to 90 mils per kilo, which means that it's, their normal glucose would be 0 point, 0 0.08 to 0 0.09 grams per kilo of serum blood glucose. The PALS recommended dose now is 6 to 11 times the normal glucose and twice to four times what the adult dose would be. So that makes no sense at all. 
Basal glucose, glucose metabolism, metabolism is 1 to 2 milligrams per kilo per minute or 60 to 120 milligrams per kilo per hour. And your insulin glucose uptake uh, is about 6 milligrams per kilo per minute or 360 milligrams per kilo per hour, which means that D10 at 0 0.1 milligram per kilo for adult or pediatric over five minutes works. It's the correct dose. So we're always, we're always given that big bolus. We're mm -hmm. always given food afterwards. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. it, it don't burn off. It, what we do is we want them awake and so to the point where they're eating so that you know that you're up there okay. No, we here, here's the answer. Now, there's good, there's literature out there. There's actual science um, on using, and there's not a lot, but uh, because you know it's it's not sexy, it's not exciting. Uh, D50 and D10 doesn't have any, you know, there's not any big markup for. It's not like amiodarone, which used to be, you know, two hundred dollars a pop. It's you know how much you know glucose is glucose. It's not that expensive. Um, but the literature, a couple of randomized studies of using D10 or D50, a um, lot of stuff comes out of uh, Britain. Uh, the Brits have used D10 and no D50 for about 15 years now. Uh, and this is what, and we've actually been using uh, D10 for about four months, five months in Camus now. Works just fine. We try it as a little side thing, small, small subset. So here's your protocol. Obtain blood for glucose. Determine glucose level. Glucose low, patient's conscious, no change. Administer oral glucose. If they're unable to take oral glucose, establish an IV. Infuse 100 mils, which is 10 grams of D10. <laughs> D10 comes in a 250 cc bag, which is 25 grams of glucose. Give them 10, 10 grams to start with. Now, I've made just a, I haven't asked you to figure out the adult weight and all that. We're just going to say an adult, a normal adult should be 100 kilo, give or take. There's still some leeway here. Give them um, 10, 10 grams, 100 cc's. Doesn't take you that long to get 100 cc's in. Usually five to 10 minutes. You can repeat. If and what are you using to repeat? Level of consciousness. React how they react. You can repeat at. 50 cc's, which is going to be 5 grams, all the way up to 25 grams. Is Cliff still here? Did you, have you had to go, have you had to do repeated doses? Three times, uh, 25. Okay. And was easy to figure out? Yeah. Okay. So they've had, tw we've had 25, 25 uses in Camus. With D10, only three times they had to repeat a dose. And uh, the nice thing is these people will not, will have a much more mellow re-entry, and they will stay much more mellow. When, you, when they stay okay and you have them eating before you leave, then you can be assured they're going to be okay. Now, alternatively, if you don't have D10, for some reason, I, mean, I don't want to. I don't want them just to throw away all the D D50. You can use your D50. I mean, we're going to transition. My preference will be to use the D10, but you're probably not going to have both available to you, or you might not. Now, if you were very clever, you could give them 10 grams of the of the D50. 
It's not that difficult. And then I'd say, God, you guys are really good. You're paying attention. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, look, look at me. I'm, I'm a person with, with almost no hope. Not depressed. Not depressed, but almost no hope. If you can't start an IV, this is no change. You give them glucagon and continue to attempt the IV, and you give uh, D10 if you need, uh, you know, when the IV is established. Now, the nice thing about, uh, about D10 also is if, if you can't get an IV and the glucagons are not working and you have to put an IO in the patient, D10 is the fluid you should put into that IO not D50, because D50 is, it, well, it is really osmotic. Sucks that little bone dry. You know? <laughs> now, if no response to the glucose, follow the altered mental status protocol. <coughs> Repeat glucose scan, perform EKG, do all, second, you know, do all the other stuff you do. Remember, this it doesn't change it. All persons who are on oral hypoglycemic agents, even if they're also on insulin, but if they're on orals as well, and anybody who's on an insulin pump, even if they wake up and say, hey, I feel great, they go to the hospital. <laughs> with a mental load, right. They go to the hospital because there's something wrong with their insulin pump or there's something wrong with their medication at that point. So... IV glucose for any hypoglycemia less than 50. Even if you give them orals, I generally give and the D10 is real nice then. So. So, and I guess we had to throw this in because uh, this was the, oh, this is the continue thing. So, repeated glucose scan after D10 administration, just like you would with D50. Uh, normal serum glucose is in the 60 to 120, and if you're in the normal range, you don't get, need to give them more. I mean, normal is normal. If they wake up, they're normal, and, you're, and they're able to take orals. Um, thiamine for alcohol abuse. Um, if they become hypoglycemia again, we use the, the dextrose 10 gram infusion D10. Okay. Other change in your protocol, which we just need to reiterate. We've talked about it before, but Narcan. Narcan, the respiratory depression or apnea dose is 2 milligrams IV or, I, or intranasal or IM. You can repeat that under the orders times 2. Child dose is there, too. For altered mentation due to narcotics or suspected narcotics. If their O2 sap, ETCO2 is normal, they're ventilating fine, they're breathing okay, they're not apneic, they're not respiratory depression. Titrate your dose, 0 0.5 milligram PRN, and you're maintaining airway and respiration. Don't worry about waking them up. You're maintaining airway and respirations. If they're opiate dependent, also titrate the dose if you if they're not apneic or respiratory depressed if they're respiratory depressed just slam it in don't worry about it you know they're going to wake up yelling hollering and kicking at you that's probably true but that's that's not your problem they've they've already proved that they don't know how to dose themselves I'm talking about opiate dependent. If it's a if it's a a, a, a junkie, if it's a if it's a, uh, um, a heroin addict, if it's a opiate dependent person who's taking, you know, uh, uh, taking medications illicitly or getting them from a physician, uh, anyone who's taking oral, you know, any or if they're wearing a pen, a fent, you know, three fentanyl patches, or more interestingly enough, if they get the big fentanyl patch instead of the one they should have got, and they get pretty well somnolent. If their if they're respiratory depression, then treat them with the big dose. If they are not respiratory depressed, if they're just somnolent, oh, there's a change of their level of consciousness, yeah. 
um, then titrate the dose so they don't withdraw in front of you. And yeah, yeah. Oh, I wouldn't give them a full dose. I don't say. I didn't say that. Well, if they're in respiratory depression, yeah. Well, you could do that. Yeah. Well, you can't. You can tit. You can. You can titrate anybody. You can titrate anybody you want, except for somebody who's really respiratory. I mean, yeah. Really respiratory depressed. If somebody has a, if you put a CO2 thing on them and they have a, they have a CO2 of 90, I think they're respiratory depressed. Okay, this is to reiterate the spinal immo immobilization algorithm because it's in your orders now. So appropriate patients for long backboard immobilization. Blunt trauma with altered level of consciousness, spinal pain and tenderness, neurologic complaint, anatomic spinal deformity, high energy mechanism injury, and any of the following intoxication, inability to communicate, and distracting injury. This is your algorithm, which has not changed in 15 or 20 years, to be honest. It's just, we're just reiterating it. Mechanism of injury. Patient mentation, they, they need to be spinally immobilized. If there's decreased level of consciousness, alcohol, drug, ingestion, which is confusing you thing, loss of consciousness involved. If they have cervical, thoracic, lumbar, spinal pain, immobilize. If they have numbness, tingling, burning, weakness, immobilize. If they have palpable you push down there if they have cervical thoracic or lumbar deformity or tenderness immobilize now not if you touch their side of their neck and they say oh my my neck is sore that's not the same this is spinal pain or deformity other severe distracting injuries and that is very subjective and you have to make the choice on that one pain with cervical range of motion you know, most of the time we, you know, yeah. so if yes to any of those things, immobilize. If no, treat and transport without full spinal mosaic, which doesn't mean you don't do spinal precautions. See collar, immobilization to a gurney, particularly if you're going to be a long transport. Um, or when you don't, when you can't use the long back, or when you can't lay grandma down on her back. Uh, if the patient's up in ambulatory at the scene, they've already done a pretty good spinal test. Now that doesn't mean that there's not some overriding, distracting injury that's making them, you know, make, confusing the issue. But that is the person who goes in the collar, goes in a position of comfort immobilized to a gurney. The hospitals have been have been in service on this. They, they still bitch about it now and again, but of course they bitch about everything that isn't exactly the way that they wanted it to be anyway, or they remembered years ago in their in their memory. Minimize movement, spinal precautions is still the thing to do, but it doesn't mean that they have to be strapped to a backboard. Now we're going to have fun. This is a new, unfortunately, unfortunately, I just went to the American Heart Association's uh, scientific meetings, and uh, there's been a big study going on in Seattle for two years now, studying whether pre-hospital cooling improves outcomes after resuscitation from cardiac arrest in patients with V-fib and and without V-fib. In other words. Just cardiac arrest. The main outcomes were primary were survival to hospital discharge and neurologic status at discharge. And what we found out there was no difference in the two groups. The ones that got pre-hospital hypothermia with two liters of IV cold saline.
There was no improvement in neurostatus. There was no improvement in the number of people discharged. What there was, interesting enough, was that even though it may not have been perfectly scientifically, um, statistically significant, the intervention group had, you know, the ones who got hypothermia, IV cold saline pre-hospital, had more rearrests and more pulmonary edema. And just a little science here is that one of the things that, that in, an, in an animal model, if you dump a lot of cold blood, cold saline, cold blood, it first, of course, the first place it goes is the right ventricle, and I mean right atrium and right ventricle. That's kind of, it turns out to be arrhythmogenic. It causes some... And it also kind of stuns the heart and probably can, would contribute, besides all that saline, you can make think, hmm, maybe we would get more, um, more congestive failure, more pulmonary edema. But it's probably not good for the heart because it goes into one chamber, or well, one chamber to start with only, and it doesn't, you know, doesn't warm the heart. Uh, it doesn't cool it evenly. And so that may not be good. That doesn't mean that another method of pre-hospital cooling might not be appropriate. But the point is, scientifically, there doesn't appear to be any advantage to making you do IV cold saline in the field. So we're going to take it out. Yeah. Exactly. The nice thing... The nice. <laughs> The, the, yeah, the, nice thing about, uh, the, the nice thing about having those coolers on board is that it's a good place to put your succinylcholine and other things like that so it will last a little longer. So we'll keep those on. Now, there's, there's other, we're, I'm looking at a couple of other methods for pre-hospital cooling that we might institute as long as it's not an not a undue expense. There's other things we need to look at. So... The, the pre-hospital cooling did in, indeed reduce the uh, amount of, uh, uh, it did reduce the temperature of the patient, core temperature, like we thought it would. Thing is, it didn't help. And it's, and it's kind of a waste of time. Quickly, a little change, other protocol change uh, for uh, IO insertion. We now memorialize that I, I like the adult humeral head. It's a really good, even though there's some argument in, in CPR whether it's better to, to put it in the humeral head or the femoral uh, or the uh, uh, tibia. Uh, we had a case where the patient, if it had been in the humeral head and he got up and started swinging after resuscitation, it probably would have, it probably would have disrupted that, or possibly. I don't know. But. So adult humeral head, have you all been trained in it now? You've gone through the little, we've had that little process, so we'll, and we'll reiterate this next month. Um, infectious disease control protocol changes, gloves, eye protection, and masks when contamination of body fluids are also dropped as possible, including a response to any sick person at a care facility. Because they're not telling us when people have have all the MRSAs and, and, and antibiotic resistant respiratory things and they're not letting us know because they think that would be a HIPAA violation. Inhalation of toxic fumes. You will not have available to you the cyano kit. At a thousand bucks a pop now and the fact that we don't use it, we're going to go back to Sodium thiosulfate, which doesn't force you to to go through the thing and saying, is this really a cyanide overdose? Is it most of the time we're not going to have cyanide overdose unless you're at a place there's most most of your people who are in house fires who are unconscious and not responsive are because of carbon monoxide, smoke inhalation, um, uh, prolonged uh, uh, cerebral ischemia and it has nothing to do with cyanide. 
If you're in industries that have cyanide, we're going to be requesting if they want to keep the cyanide kit on, you know, I'll write them a prescription. They can keep a cyanide kit for their own persons. The hospitals have them. They don't keep a lot, by the way. So to have EMS bear the brunt of, you know, several thousands of dollars per year, we throw these things away. Plus, you know, the burn, the burn centers are very upset. The minute you use the cyanide kit, you can't use a pulse oximeter to monitor the patient for about two weeks. So it makes it difficult. Sodium thiosulfate, back to the old thing, it's cheap. They almost give it away. Um, 50 cc's of a 25% solution over 10 minutes. And it does work. It doesn't work as well as the cyano kit, but it also doesn't force you into thinking, hey, I'm just spending a thousand, well, actually, it's $2,000 because you have to use two kits on, a, on an adult. So you're spending $2,000 on something you're not really sure about. Sodium thiosulfate? Yeah. Not that I can think of. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, I mean, tr tr try to use some common sense and say, yeah, this is likely to be a, I mean, it should, it should, it should, I mean, I, I know that's asking, it's asking a lot, you know, of, of the medic, but. Okay, pain control. For children, we now, we now can give. You don't have to start an IV to give the kid, a kid with a broken arm who's having some pain, you can give them the fentanyl intranasally. Little squirt. One to two micrograms per kilo. Rapid sequence induction, we simply added to the protocol because it wasn't in there before the King Vision laryngoscope and the eye gel. Okay. Alps, I gotta quickly go through Alps. I'm gonna be very quick because I want to go to the to the case reviews. Alps inclusion, non-traumatic out of hospital cardiac arrest, vascular access, IV or IO, persistent recurring VFib, VTAC after one or more shocks. We've got some real good feedback from the Alps people lately. We've had some great cases in Clark County. We haven't been missing cases, and they picked the one of the crews had uh, um, V-fib arrest that occurred during transport, recurred, and was appropriately treated with both doses of, uh, of uh, uh, the ALPS kit and uh, was delivered in good, sh in actually good condition to the hospital and had excellent documentation. Perfect chart. Uh, we can't use any open label IVM, aodorone, or lidocaine. If you use lidocaine for any reason, like if you put it in the IO, you can't use it. Can't use the ALPS kit then. Just go on with the regular, with your regular um, uh, cardiac arrest um, protocol. Can't use it, obviously, remember, protected, you know, kids, prisoners, uh, pregnancy, traumas. We don't do traumas. A shock is any shock administered by any agency or any any pre-hospital shock by an AED, the only shock that doesn't count is an ICD shock. The patient said, my ICD went off. Okay, we don't count that as a shock. Um, so any pre-hospital shock. Persistent recurring V-fib is obviously confirmed V-fib, pulses VTAC that, that has had one shock and is back in VFib immediately or delayed. One shock, doing okay, then goes back to VFib, that's recurring VFib. Well, they ran some number. they ran numbers, uh, preliminary numbers, and they said, hmm, well, we don't have enough information yet to say one way or the other. What may be happening, and this is just my own gestalt on it, is that there's no significant difference between any arm. And that's going to be, that's going to be a little frustrating because people who believe in drugs will say, well, we've got to use the drug. People who don't believe in drugs say it doesn't make any difference. Yeah, I told you so, right? 
So give the drugs as soon as possible, which you're doing within 10. That's not been a problem over here, except when we didn't give the drugs because we forgot, you know, had brain farts and didn't remember that, you know, this was a Alps entry. If I OSC and you get VFib, VTAC returns, you, you know, finish up the, you either start the Alps or finish the Alps procedure. If you use all the drugs, give shocks, no open label amyo or lidocaine, you can use magnesium because it's not an anti dysrhythmic per se. Got to use the clear link adapter, the broken syringe, any place you, you they fall out of the Alps study and you go into the regular, in, into your regular protocol, but you still have to call to let them know. That's your enrollment number. Everybody's been calling. We've, we've been very good on this county. Okay, Mark, where is the, what? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Yes. Okay. Can I get out of this just by? Okay. Shut you down. <laughs> that's not not. That's not Dr. Marlowe. Okay, knew we'd have some luck here. Okay, a couple of interesting cases. I would try to be quick on these. 32-year-old female uh, in bed, snoring respirations. Husband is holding a patient. Stacy's daughter heard the patient moaning, was unable to wake her up. Patient is. A para one gravita eight, which means she's had a lot of miscarriages or issues, and this pregnancy has been normal without complication. Takes Vicodin for back pain, has prenatal care, denies hypertension, prior seizures, headaches, preeclampsia, anything. Patient unresponsive with snoring respirations, has a small amount of bloody sputum in mouth. Blood glucose is 187. She has a pressure of 152, pulse 120, bag put on a tarp, carried downstairs, got Versed, got two grams of mag in a bag. Why? Blood to be preeclampsia. Is that a normal blood pressure for a pregnant woman? No. Now, it doesn't mention here anything here whether they bother to look for sacral or for, for uh, ankle edema or anything like that, but no big deal at this point. Two grams of mag in a bag, uh, got some more Versed, got a milligram of Narcan, went through the altered mental status, and she was, and she did have in her history, she had uh, Vicodin for back pain, which is kind of interesting for pregnancy anyway. Um, code 3 to Legacy, Salmon Creek. SAS remained in 98 to 100, consist, assisted respirations, arrived at the air, no change, patient transferred to MD. Uh, it was assumed she had seized, uh, I'm, I'm sure that they thought she had seized uh, with the moaning unable and then unconsciousness and that she was post, she was probably post ictal. Uh, probably won't, won't harm probably probably won't help much. The mag is what you would, you know, I'd like to see the Versed used if you actually were sure she was seizing. Now, there's not enough information on this. She's, uh, whether she was, um, she's unresponsive, snoring respirations. Uh, nice thing about Versed is it's not gonna cause any significant harm at that level either. Ordinarily, I would reserve it for seizure. It makes no sense. So we just, we give it no. Uh, I'm assuming, uh, and this is only a, this is only a, um, 
uh, a synopsis of the chart, I'm assuming that she may have had um, she may have had deviated, you know, eyes deviated once I, and it was assumed possibly still seizing. It is not, you know, it is not given for eclampsia unless you have, um, unless you think you're having seizures or if you're, or if they're exceptionally agitated. And there actually is more news at 11, as they say. When they got the legacy, the patient did not have any, there were no fetal heart tones. So the patient went immediately to a crash C-section. The baby is still in uh, NICU. Uh, baby has, um, um, baby actually has uh, uh, some congenital heart defects. Has nothing to do with this, per se. Uh, but uh, what's the what's one of the de what's one of the downsides and side effects of eclampsia? Obviously, seizure is one. Stroke is one. What about the placenta? Yeah, abruption. And abruptions are often associated with the hypertension, and it's aggravated if the patient has a seizure. So mm, six to one. So this patient did have an abruption. And uh, the baby was gotten out in time to be alive. Now, I don't know how the baby's going to do, but nobody does. But this is one of the compl you know, I, I, in general, making, making an assumption, I think making an assumption that, or making the decision this was abruption or it was a, uh, a eclampsia is a, is a good choice. I can argue the Versad, it's not harming. And I'm assuming that they felt the patient was still having some sort of seizure-like activity. Okay, code three for chest pain. 74-year-old male complains of shortness of breath and weakness since yesterday. Shortness of breath and weakness, well, remember, shortness of breath and weakness are not really high on that thing of, you know, is this, is this, um, is this a, AMS or a um, ACS kind of thing, acute coronary syndrome, but it is there. Um, onset after yard work, no syncope, came inside, laid down, has been in bed since, except for having to go to the bathroom. Well, curiously, he also has diarrhea, denies chest pain or abdominal pain, just shortness of breath and weakness. So he gets a, his pulse oximetry is 89, blood pressure's. Uh, 126 or 50. Um, so this is his. So his initial pulse rate is 31. And uh, let's see, we got, uh, but his blood pressure is pretty good. Um, pulse rate is 32 ultimately. Um, he does have an AV block, third degree. And what is his, um, what can you tell me about this? Can you, can you read a STEMI in this? First of all, what kind of a what kind of a ventricular rhythm is this? I mean, where where is this? Where, where what kind of a block has he got? I mean, he's got a third degree block, but what kind of a intraventricular block does he have? Is this a right or a left bundle branch pattern? Come on, everybody! We just had a whole. It's a left bundle branch pattern, so you would ordinarily not be able to interpret. But look at the look at the we've got concordance in two leads. Now, this is a minor point. You don't really need to do too much. This guy is, is not this guy is not healthy. You're gonna take him kind of code three to the hospital anyway. Uh, the cardiologists didn't think much about this anyway either, because they got too excited about the other things. Um, 
And they actually called it a non-STEMI, although I don't agree. Uh, I think you're going to interpret this one. And the first EKG in the, in the ED looks like this, too. But this guy has other issues. He has um, chronic renal failure. He was hyperkalemic as well. Hyperkalemia is one of the reasons that you get blocks and wide, funny-looking QRS complexes. Uh, so they started treating him in the ED with normal treatment for a hyperkalemia. He had a right pneumonia. Um, and they took him, they were going to take him to the cath lab. He had a past history of a cabbage, 2004. He had uh, stents in 90, uh, 98. Um, they paced him. They put in an AICD pacer. And he decided, he, did, he said that he didn't want to go back to cath lab because he had, uh, he, because of his chronic renal failure, uh, all that dye and stuff like that is not particularly good. So he opted out of that, and he's just at home now with his pacer and other things. But, you know, um, yeah. We did not pace him. And what could he have? What could he have gotten as a trial if you didn't want to pay him? He's got a nice blood pressure. He's awake, and and he doesn't appear to be any emergent thing that you needed to deal with. He got better, by the way. His block got less, didn't go away, when they treated his hyperkalemia. You know. So the, there wasn't any. There wasn't any any reason to really jump on him and do bad things to him and make him hurt, you know, with a pacer. There wasn't any reason to give him a... He, he's, he was alert-oriented. He's the one who called the hospital or called for transport. He was threatening. He was a very threatening person. You know, no, actually, if I, if I told you that, you'd probably, you'd probably go out and jump on him. Okay, code, this one is an interim. Code 3 for a seizure. 70-year-old male... Caregivers relay patients seized and then fell. He has a history of seizures. Okay. He had he has a traumatic brain injury from about age seven. He's now seventy. Um, and so it's not unusual for him to have seizures. Uh, he's developmentally delayed. He was aware of surroundings, complaining of feeling dizzy, no other complaints, sitting on the floor, talking with caregivers. Vitals were Blood pressure was low, um, heart rate was okay at the time, then blood pressure fell to 60, um, and then as they were busy chatting with him, he does this. What is this? Yeah, it's VTAC. New. No. So they sparked him. And he, and as we, you know, after, after sparking him, uh, he comes back in normal sinus rhythm, systolic blood pressure, uh, wasn't, pulse rate was 84, good pulse strength, uh, ETCO2 was okay, uh, transport him. He, uh, he went to open heart surgery a day later. Uh, two vessel cabbage put in an AICD as well we're assuming that some of his um, some of his seizures in the past possibly were due to him going into his in, into VFEB yeah yeah we took him uh, and, and he and he wasn't armed so he didn't have any problem going in and he was unconscious before, when they put him into the rig. No, so that was a that was a great case. Um, okay, here is a 52-year-old male. Sudden onset of chest pain after eating. Pain is dull. Nine of ten. Sweating, nausea, and left arm pain. No right arm pain. Uh, took three aspirin. Pain, uh, pain subsided but returned prior to EMS coming. 
uh, before calling, um, oriented in obvious distress, um, and this was interpreted by the crews, and I think appropriately, as ST segment elevation in V2, V3, V4, but 2 and 3. He has uh, no significant, well, he may have a little bit of, a uh, little bit of sag in 3 in AVF, which, you know, might make you think, but it was appropriately called as a STEMI and taken to the ED. Now, the, where in the ED they decided not to call it a STEMI, Although his troponin at, at five hours rose to quadruple what it should have been, so he had he said, "Hmm, this is a deal." So they took him to the cath lab. He had 95 percent stenosis in the circumflex, mild LED, and uh, RCH stenosis had a stent. Did fine, went home. So you guys were right; they were wrong. Yeah. Um, actually, they, they decided, and the cardiologist looked at it and decided this was a non-STEMI, and they waited for the they they waited for the troponins to come in, and the troponins were elevated. And they took him to the cath lab at, at that point. Probably five hours. Still, still not, still not in a you know. You know the thing; they're all going to be over. They're all going to be overread, and that's the way the hierarchy of the system is. But uh, you know, I read this one as positive myself. So, so I, I'm sending it. I'm sending it back to the to the to the cardiologist as a nye uh, nye. You know, it's only fair. They they complain. They complain when you overcall it. Yeah. You know, so, okay. This one's going to be real quick. This is a patient, MVA, needed to be extricated, female. Another engine dis dispatched, uh, four-door sedan, side of and tree, airbags, no side curtain airbags. Uh, driver's side door had 16 to 18 inches of intrusion. 50-year-old female, lone occupant, restrained in the seat, shallow respirations, only responsive to painful stimuli. Uh, no verbal response, uh, skin pale, cool, dry. Uh, HENT uh, laceration to the head, uh, chest appears intact without crevitus, but breath sounds absent on left side, shallow and rapid on the right. Uh, no rigidity of the abdomen, pelvis, okay, extremities, okay. So, rula, hemonumo, multi system trauma, um, no radial pulses, only carotids, uh, C collar place, rapid extrication. Uh, needle compression of the left chest met with resistance. Relocated laterally, attempted again with good pass through chest wall. However, reported that, and they got an IO going, transfer care. Now, it's reported needle compression with a 14 gauge angio in the left chest. Paramedics noted there was no air but a whole lot of blood from the catheter on placement. On arrival, there's not active bleeding from the catheter, it appears kinked. Noted the catheter appears in the second intercostal space, but nearer the sternum than midclavicular. And here's the CT scan. And you can see a, the little red arrow was not on the patient when she arrived. <laughs> We've added that. There's a little, there's a track. Yeah, that's, that's quite medium. Midclavicular is out there a ways. This goes down, tracks down, and that track goes through the skin there and goes down right into that aortic knob and there was a there was a hematoma on the aorta now, of course aorta is a tough organ so needle puncture through it it's not going to kill you uh, but it's a little medial placement and you know you're supposed to go you're supposed to go straight down remember not toward the heart so go straight down that's you know in the heat of things, that's what happens sometimes. Uh, it's just a, a bit, you know, midclavicular is midclavicular. 
And there's a couple of other things right under there that you might also snick being a little medial because you can get into the internal mammary artery, which also causes some bleeding. You got one of those, yeah, I know. Um, pardon? Oh, yes, I think so. Yes. I mean, this particular one? Uh, humor head, yeah, good, good, a good IO place. So, uh, any rate, uh, that's just for information. We're not chastising anybody. This is, but this is, uh, um, so we get better and better. That's why we keep practicing those things. Okay. Have a good holiday. Uh, we will remember January will be a skill session. We'll be back doing uh, a cardiac arrest, CPR, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera.